Amen. God started to speak. He helped me zoom out and gain some perspective. And so that was really cool. And so I want to share with you a few things that I learned while I was away that I already knew, but I was reminded, okay? So the first thing I wanted to tell you that I, I really saw in a new light was that God is awesome. God is awesome. I, I want to show you a couple of pictures from our vacation. This is one of the rocks in Sedona. They have these uh, little mesas and buttes all over, and you look at that and you're like, wow, how does that rock even red? You know, you just like, you look at it, and when you're standing there looking at it, it's just unbelievable. Um, the next picture is uh, the most spectacular view was the Grand Canyon. Like, we're standing there looking at that, and, and can I tell you that this picture can't even begin to capture what it's like to stand and look like 25 miles across this thing. And it's just, you're looking at it and you're like, God carved this. How, this thing is massive. My God is bigger. This thing could not begin to contain my God. He is so big. And so, and then, and I don't have pictures of this because our cameras couldn't catch it, but we're, we're looking out and we see uh, the night sky in Arizona. And there's no light pollution there. So you're just standing out there and you're seeing all of these stars. And at some point you can see the Milky Way. And, and you see this expanse. And, and, and you're just standing there in the pitch black looking up saying, God, when I think about your promise to Abraham, that your descendants will be as the stars in the sky. And the fact that you're standing here today and you know who Abraham is tells you that God is the God of the promise, right? And so, and then we're, we climb down into this thing and we, we watch the mules coming up, packing stuff out of the Grand Canyon. And honestly, at this point, we're about a thousand feet down and I, I was trying to climb on one of the mules to get back up because down is a lot easier than up in Jesus name, you know? It was, so we did that. And then, and then um, we also, another one of the things that we saw were the cactus were in bloom. So all of these cacti have, so this is a prickly pear with a, with a flower on it, but all these big saguaro cactuses are, they're like, you know, 50 feet tall, some of these things. And they got their arms that go up like this. And you've all seen those like in the Westerns and stuff. And, and when we were, when I was walking at night, and I was looking out at the saguaros. It, I was just praising God, and I was like, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky is the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech, and night after night, they display knowledge. And I'm looking, and I'm just praising God, and as I look over, all the saguaros were worshiping with me. I was like, man, if I could get Hope City Church to worship like this, whoo! I'm telling you, but you know, the scripture says that even if we don't praise him, the rocks will cry out, but I'm not going to let a rock out praise me. So, and then the next picture is of a place in Tucson called Gates Pass. And so if you've seen some of the old Western movies, um, even the movie Tombstone, I don't know if you remember that one with, uh, with it, it had Val Kilmer as Doc Holliday. I'm your Huckleberry. You remember that? And so he's... All of the background here, it was shot just below this hill, so that was kind of cool to see that. And then um, this is one of the neatest cacti that I saw, and that was, it's called a silver touch. And it's just, I, I'm looking at all the diversity, even in the cactus plants that are growing. And I was like, man, this is so amazing. And then we see all of the different wildlife, and there are these little gambrel quail that have the little thing on their head like they're always asking a question like what i don't even know what, what are you thinking i don't know you know and so and then we also we're cruising around and we saw these guys a um, lot of stray dogs like this i tried to put it in the back of the minivan and take it but it was real snippy and so no i'm just kidding these are coyotes um but we saw them they were like all over the place just like 15 feet away you're standing there and you're like 
hey, Mr. Coyote, don't kill me, you know, but it was kind of cool seeing those. And then here's a view. We we're heading up to a place called Mount Lemon, and we could look out and see the Sonoran Desert and the Tucson Valley out there. It was super amazing to watch. And then this is our view from up on Mount Lemon. Look at that. There had been a fire that came through. When was it, Dad? Like last year? Last year, fire came through and burned down a lot of stuff. Um, but the view there, like you're standing there, you're looking and you're like, man, does it get any better than this? And then you remember the Grand Canyon. And you're like, yeah, it does. But this is amazing to see this stuff. And then um, one final picture. Every morning, Pastor Mike and Loretta would get up and they would go out and have their coffee and do their devotions and sit out. This was their view. Every morning when we would pull out of the driveway, this is what we saw. And we're just like, Lord, your majesty is on display. And so I love, I love, I love when God shows off. And sometimes it takes a change of scenery to remind us how great God is. So even, even if you can't go to the Sonoran Desert, maybe take a drive up into the mountains. Maybe take a walk into the forest by a creek. Find yourself in a place where you can take in the beauty and glory of God and just be amazed by who he is, all right? Here's the second thing that God reminded me of when we were on vacation, and that is you are called even when you're on vacation. You know that? You don't, you don't get to take time off from who you are in Christ just because you go on vacation. Because the people around you, their eternity is more important than your vacation. I'll say, I, I'm just gonna, for, for the folks that didn't hear what I just said, the folks that you meet when you're on your day off or you're on a vacation, their eternity is more important than your vacation. And so plan to be interrupted. Allow yourself to be interrupted. We got to minister to some folks. We got to love on some people. We got to, to spend time with folks who were hurting and struggling and in a deep place of just feeling overwhelmed by the weight of sin and life, choices that had been so destructed, and we had prayed and fasted before we went for weeks and weeks leading up, asking God to do a work, and God did some amazing things. Some of you were praying with us, and I will tell you this story later, but God was doing some great things. So we're, we're grateful that we're called all the time because if we stopped doing what God called us to do, we wouldn't have testimonies of the glory of God. The third thing I learned, bad things do not know that you are on vacation. Somebody say preach, preacher. And so we were, uh, when, we got, when we got there, we left, we kind of had this head cold um, that had been going around. And so when you're on an airplane with a head cold, it is not a blessed time because the pressure and stuff, I literally, I felt like my eye was gonna explode at one point. I'm sitting there just holding my eye like maybe I could hold it in. It just like, it hurt. Gracie had some kind of allergic reaction to whatever was pollinating the desert. I'm like, first of all, the desert's not supposed to be pollinated. Like Tucson is supposed to be the place where there are no allergies. They lied. And so Gracie looked like, poor girl, she looked like she had been in the ring with Mike Tyson. She, her eyes were all swollen. I went to wake her up in the morning and she, she looks up at me and she goes, Dad. <laughs> She's, she was all jacked up, but we got some loratadine in her. We prayed for her and uh, she was able to enjoy at least a week. And then Daniel got sick with a stomach bug and was violently throwing up for 24 hours. But the good news is Mary also got it. <clears throat> and she was sick for like 24 hours throwing up. And, uh, but it was just, it was crazy. I'm thankful that it didn't spread beyond that. But can I tell you something? God is still good. And, and here's the thing that we have to remember when things go bad in our lives, God is still good even though you're experiencing bad things, right? God's faithfulness, God's goodness is not dependent on your struggle. God is still good. 
He was good before you were struggling. He's good while you're struggling, and he will be good after you're done struggling. And can I tell you something? If you'll prepare yourself not to focus on your struggle, but focus on your salvation, you will not struggle like you do normally. And can I just, I I believe this is a word of the Lord for some of you guys. Get out of your head. Get out of your head. Sometimes we will sit there and just dwell on and camp out on all the stuff that's going wrong. And we forget that God saved us. He delivered us. He set us free. He brought a sunrise to remind us. He put the stars in the skies so that we could see his glory on display. We get to see the creativity of nature. You're breathing today. You're walking today. We got a testimony of God's healing this morning. God is good in spite of what you're struggling with. He's good. And and sometimes you have to let your mouth overwhelm what you're thinking. Let me explain this. Sometimes when I'm walking around, I was in Home Depot yesterday, and this guy was looking at me like I was crazy um, because I was walking around, and I didn't realize, but I was praying in the Spirit kind of loud. And um, I'm just walking through Home Depot, and I'm praying in the Spirit. And, and this guy, he's standing there, he's looking at me, he's like, he literally stopped, and he's standing there going, And I was like, oh, that's kind of loud. That's okay. That's okay. I'm going to keep praying in the spirit, right? And I just kept walking through prayer. Why? Because I have to let my mouth declare the glory of God to quiet the noise that's in my head, right? Why is the scripture so explicit that we need to declare, declare? Let my mouth declare the praises of God, right? Right? Why? Because we need our mouth to overpower the voices in our head. You got to silence it. So I want you to keep that perspective and kill the stress. The last thing that I want to talk about, and this is where I'm going to hang out for the longest, and that is that rest and reflection is a must. Rest and reflection is a must. I heard a mom a few years ago as she described her typical day. And this is what she said. She said, I get up at 5.30, I take a quick shower, I slam down breakfast, pack lunches, get the kids ready, drop the kids off at school, go to work, skip lunch, go pick the kids up from school, take one to soccer practice and one to dance, go through the drive through pick up some dinner, pick up one child from soccer, drop them off at karate, go get the other child from the dance class and take them to the swimming lessons and give them food on the way. After that's done, I take the kids home, help them with their homework, clean the house and fall into bed. Good times, good times. You know what's interesting to me is that in our culture, busyness is the most impressive badge of honor that we wear. You talk to somebody, you say, how you doing? Oh, I'm busy, right? It's like the currency of culture now. Busyness is the new status symbol. How are things, I'm busy. Okay, what are you busy with? Just stuff, busy, Just busy. Busy. And guys, those of you that know me, you know that I'm not afraid of hard work. I like to work hard. Um, it's, it's, I, I could tend toward, toward being a workaholic, okay? Um, there are some weeks when I put in 80 hours a week for, you know, weeks on end. But here's one thing that I do. I will always, always, always guard my Sabbath day. If you call and you leave a voicemail for me, you're gonna hear on my answer machine. If you're calling on a Friday, I'm enjoying the day out with my family, right? That's a sacred day for me. Sunday can't be my Sabbath because I'm a pastor. Saturday can't be my Sabbath because I always got stuff popping on Saturday. So Friday is my Sabbath and I guard it and protect it, why? Because I have to quiet things in order to keep perspective. You have to do that. You have to do that. Um, I think there is an internal desire placed in us by God to want to accomplish uh, things, to be valued, to make a difference. I mean, we all feel that it's intrinsic to being created in the image of God. But what can happen is that can become an idol if you're not careful, right? We can start to worship 
the things that give us value, and sometimes busyness gives us value, what I produce and give back to society gives me value, things that I accomplish, I get noticed for, so I need those things to build myself up and feel good, but what God has done by giving us Sabbath is he's allowed us to say, it's not about what I do, it's about who I am and who I am in him, because God designed me, made me in his image, and he gave me a day, that he said, is for him and for rest. Aren't you glad? Like this should be the sermon that I preach that gets more amens than anything else, right? Because it's the easiest to apply. Like rest, right? Pastor John is a great example of, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just messing with him. So when we, when we think about it, what do we look at? Why do we know we need to rest? Well, Exodus chapter 20, verses eight through 11. Let's read it. If you got your Bible, turn there real quick. It says, remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work. How many days do you have? I just read it, so it's like, this, this is easy. This is not, so you have six days, yes, Haley, thank you for listening. And so you have six days for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes your sons and your daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, and, and any foreigners living among you. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day, he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. Now, some people will read that and they'll say, well, pastor, but that's the law. We're not under law anymore. We're under grace. Right? Okay. Good point. So that means that you should commit adultery. You should murder. You should steal. Right? Like, because we're not under the law. So, like, I should just start murdering people because I'm not under the law. I'm under grace. So God's grace means that I can murder as many people as well, that's foolish logic, isn't it, right? So there are things that are knit into the order of how God designed and created things. Sabbath is part of that. Murder goes to valuing human life, right? Jesus talks about how you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two things, right? And so if, if I steal from you, I'm not loving you right? And so these are things. And so what does God say? He said, I did it in six days and I took a day off. That's what I want you to do. He said it in the order of creation. And so in Genesis chapter two, you flip back there. Genesis chapter two, verse one says, so the creation of the heavens and the earth and everything in them was completed. God didn't rest because he was tired. He rested because he was done, right? It's not like God created the heavens and the earth and everything in them and went, whew, I am worn out. We need a vacation, right? He says, it's completed. On the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation, so he rested from all his work and God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy because it was the day when he rested from all the work of creation. And so what we see is how God has modeled that out for us. I wanna read something real quickly. You don't have to turn there, you can if you want. But I want you to notice something at the end of each day of creation, okay? So Genesis 1, 5 says, God called the light day and the darkness night, evening passed and morning came, marking the first day. Genesis 1, 8 says, and evening passed and morning came, marking the second day. Verse 13 says, and evening passed and morning came, marking the third day. You see this pattern? It goes through six days of creation. When we get to the seventh day of creation, the Sabbath, there is no, and evening came and morning passed the seventh day. It doesn't say that. Because the design that God had for humanity was that we live in a perpetual Sabbath. That was his goal for humanity. But then what man did is man chose to take on 
the na- he wanted to take on what was designed for God only, and that was the knowledge of good and evil, and sinned against God. And when man sinned against God, he embraced slavery. And so we read in the scripture, it says that by the ground, the man will toil all the days of his life, right? So now instead of being in a lush garden where he's just a caretaker and supervisor, now he has to toil to the ground. So he becomes a slave to the ground. And now this process is constant, right? And then what do we see with the the people of Israel? The people of Israel are slaves in Egypt. How many of you know that the, the guys with the whips in Egypt were not known for giving guys good comp time and days off, right? It was, you're gonna work and you're gonna work seven days a week and this is gonna be a part of your identity because you are a slave. And so this is the way that it goes for 430 years. And it's interesting because the, the culture that we live in sends us the same message and that is, you're a slave. You gotta work all the time if you're gonna beat the competition, if you're gonna make enough money, if you're gonna set yourself apart, you have to work all the time. I remember Bill, when, when we first started coming to, when we first came to Hope City, and Bill, if you don't know, owns the best snowball stands in Baltimore. And they are amazing, especially chocolate peanut butter with ice cream in the middle, that's the best one. And so, um, and, and your mother posted a picture of a chocolate peanut butter snowball. I didn't even like the picture on Facebook because it was so sinful looking at it. I was like, man, I got too much weight to look in to, to lose, to like that thing. But when, when we came, he was talking about how God was convicting him. Like, I feel like I need to close the snowball stands on Sunday, but that's our biggest revenue day. I don't know what to do. And he kept talking about it. Like every time I was seeing him, he was like, what do you think? What do you think I should do? I was like, man, it sounds like you, you know what you're supposed to do. And I remember when the first season when he closed and, and he said, it's been amazing to see how God has supplied, how God has blessed it because we chose to honor God. So when you go to Icy Delights, you'll see on the snowball stand, a sign that says we're closed on Sunday to honor God and spend time with family. I think something and rest and rest. So it's, it's one of those things that you put those principles to work in your, in your life and God will multiply what you can't do. Because can I tell you something? God's still working even when you're not. And so when you take a day off, just let you off the hook. You're not the Messiah. You're nobody's savior. And so if you take a day off, Do you know that planet Earth will continue to turn in your absence? It's amazing. It's crazy. We'll still continue to take revolutions around the sun, even on your day off. Now, it might upset, you know, the gravity or something. It might, but I don't think so. I think it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And so the Israelites watch this kind of happen throughout as they dishonor God. What happens? They get taken captive by Babylon and they end up in bondage in Babylon. And so this is a trend. And this is what we still see because it's a principle, it's not a law, it's a principle of scripture. Sabbath is a principle and you need rest. And so all through scripture, I wanna do one more quick uh, scripture here and it's found in 1 Kings For those of you that aren't familiar with this story, there's a prophet of God named Elijah, and he was was so cool. I love Elijah's stories, because he's like, he was the fire from heaven prophet, right? Because in in 1 Kings 18, which I know is Nick's favorite chapter in scripture, 1 Kings 18, there are so many cool things that happen, but one of the things that happens is that Elijah is on the mountain with the prophets of Baal, and he calls down fire from heaven, and God answers, and boom, here comes the fire, and it's crazy. It's funny, though, because that's not the only time he calls down fire. He calls down fire another time when the king sends a detachment of 50 people to come get him and bring him back, and Elijah's like, I don't think I'll go with you today. God, send fire. And he like nukes all 50 people. And then the king sends another detachment of 50 people. And and Elijah's like, I don't think I want to go with you today. And they get nuked. And so there's like another detachment. And this detachment of people, they come, they're like, 
Um, so we heard about that we're just going to stay back here, but we just want to recommend. Like, you don't have to. Whatever you want to do, you do you, boo-boo. But we just, like, we, we just want to wreck. Like, I'm just, don't kill the messenger. We're just, and so Elijah's like, all right, I'll go. So it's, it's crazy, but this guy, this is his life. So I love Elijah's stories. Well, in, in 1 Kings 19, remember, this is right after he's just called fire down from heaven, displaced the prophets of Baal. They've been slaughtered. Everything looks good for the kingdom and people of God at this point. But we catch up with Elijah. So check this out. Um, 19, let's start with verse one. It says, Saul now urged his servants and his son Jonathan uh, to assassinate. I'm in the wrong spot, aren't I? It's second Kings, isn't it? Is it second Kings? It's second Kings. Everybody calm down. Where is it? Somebody look it up and tell me so I can preach it. Is it first Kings, but I'm in the right spot? Somebody help the preacher. Oh, here it is. I just reading the wrong thing. Y'all are good. I thought I read this again this morning. I'm like, I know the sermon notes were right. All right. So is it up on the screen? Thank you, tech guys. We love you. God bless us with good tech people. All right, so read that. When Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent the message to Elijah. May the God strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went, went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Very melodramatic for a prophet of God, isn't it? Like, so we literally come to Elijah on his worst day, arguably after his best day, right? He has just had the mountaintop, literally the mountaintop experience, and now he finds himself in a valley. Doesn't it seem logical and reasonable that Elijah should have been like, girl, you want a piece of this right here? Come on. I got fire coming from heaven. You bring it, right? But that's not what he does. He's like, I think, God, that I would rather you just kill me now because she's probably going to come with all her makeup on and she's going to take me out, right? And you're just like, Elijah. Like, chill, man. It's okay. And so here's what happens. Read verse, verse 5. You would think that God would, like, give Elijah a pep talk and be like, hey, Elijah, you remember what just happened on the mountain? Don't worry. I did that yesterday. I can do something today. Just relax, right? But God doesn't give him a pep talk. He just leaves him there. And he's like, I want to die. And, and so here's what happens next. <clears throat> then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. Can I tell you something? Sometimes when you're having a bad day, you just need a nap. Somebody say, preach, pastor. Pre Some Can I tell you that you are not more sanctified because you stay up and grind than you are if you go lay down and take a nap because you aren't any good to anybody for that hour when you could have been sleeping. Everybody wishes you'd go take a nap. So just go take a nap. Rest. Let God do what God's going to do while you're off the clock for an hour or two hours or three hours. You will wake up. You will wake up. Now check this out. It says, but as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat, to which I would say that was kind of rude. He could have just brought the meal after he woke up, right? But he does. So we've got like the Food Network angel that shows up, wakes Elijah up from his nap, and it says, he looked around and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. 
So he ate and drank and lay down again. Sometimes you need two naps. Come on, somebody. Then the angel of the Lord came and touched him and said, get up and eat some more or the journey ahead will be too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank and the food gave him enough strength to travel for 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. There he came to a cave where he spent the night. Sometimes your physical body needs to have some rest so you can get to a place where God will meet you. Sometimes you are so tired and so jacked up and so in your head that you can't even be in a place where you can receive from God because you got too much spinning around up in here that you couldn't hear him if he talked to you anyway. So we got to build rest into our spiritual disciplines. It's a sp How many of you have heard preachers preach on you have to have time in prayer, you got to have time in the word, right? You need to be out evangelizing, you need to tithe. But how many of you have heard a preacher say you need to work naps into your spiritual disciplines? I'm telling you, you do. Your key to longevity is rest. And your key to keeping you in your proper place and allowing God to be God and be in his proper place is to take time off and rest so that you realize you're not God. You're not God. And so as we go through this, there is so much more to teach on this. There is so much good stuff. But the reality is that Jesus sets a pattern for it too, doesn't he? Because Jesus tells us, matter of fact, if we look at Matthew real quick, and this is gonna be the last scripture that I use today. And we'll land the plane because everybody's warm. But just remember the people in Ecuador are warmer than you are. Yes, I will play that card. Just like your mom used to say, the children in Africa wish they could have food, right? I remember telling my mom one time, I don't mind if you box it up and send it to him. It's okay. It's okay. I'm just not hungry. So anyway, here we are. So I want you to listen to this. Uh, Matthew chapter 14, verse 13. It says, as, as soon as Jesus heard the news, he left in a boat to a remote area to be alone. What was he going to do? He's going to be alone. He's going to rest. He's going to hear from God. He's going to disconnect. He's going to unplug. Why? Because those 12 disciples were exhausting, right? And not only that, but serving in ministry to the needs of people all day, every day. It's exhausting. It taps you out. So many of us, we're used to dealing with our problems. But when you start to be the one that carries the burdens of others, you open yourself up spiritually to a level of exhaustion that is not common to most, right? Because you're a burden bearer. Now, don't feel sorry for those who bear others' burdens, right? We're commissioned by Christ to bear one another's burdens. We're supposed to be doing it. So when we're just bearing our own burden, that's not spiritually, Christologically, a logical thing to do. We need to be bearing the burdens of others. So it's not like just pastor's job to bear the burden. Yes, we do. We, that's what we signed up for, and you know what? I am so thankful that God has given me this opportunity. I welcome it. I love to walk with you when you're struggling, okay? But this is what we're called to as believers in Jesus, but we have to disconnect. We have to unplug sometimes in order to do it. So listen, it says, but the crowds heard where he was headed and followed on foot from many towns. So Jesus has taken the shortcut by boat across the Sea of Galilee, and while he's taking the shortcut, the whole crowd, now keep in mind, there's 5,000 men plus women and children. So can you imagine this crowd of like 20,000 people going along the shoreline? Like, <laughs> followed, he's in the boat, we're going, we're gonna meet him there. And they show up, I don't know how fast they were going, but they must have been trucking because they get over there before Jesus. And it says, um, Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat and he had compassion on them and he healed the sick. That evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, that isn't necessary, you feed them. 
To which the disciples said, hmm? We don't have any food. The convoy of hope is not here. We can't do this, you know? And so they say, but we have only five loaves of bread and two fish. Bring them here, he said. Then he told the people to sit down on the grass. Jesus took the five loaves and two fish, looked up toward heaven and blessed them. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he gave the bread to the disciples who distributed to the people. They all ate as much as they wanted, and afterwards, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftovers. About 5,000 men were fed that day, in addition to all the women and children. In a second, I'm going to give you just a quick side sermon, but I want you to hear something. The disciples fed the people. Jesus provided the miracle. The disciples distributed the miracle. Jesus provided the miracle. It's the same way in this house. I don't know where the money's gonna come from necessarily to fix weird, this unanticipated expenses with the air conditioners and the electric. And I'm thankful we've got money in the bank and praise God, but it's unanticipated expenses. Where does it come from? From him. It's the same place it's always come from. It's the same place it came from when I first came here. And we didn't have two nickels to rub together and God continued to provide. The God that provided then is the same God that provides now. He's not only sustaining us, he's propelling us, he's giving us what we need, and he's giving us more. And the more that we give out, the more that he gives in. And the more that God supplies, and the more miracles God provides. And so I'm just going to keep trusting him. Because he puts the miracle in my hand, and I get to give it away. Man, that's good. Now, here's the thing. It's another little thing that I learned on vacation. Sometimes people ask me, hey, pastor, why do, you, why do you do what you do? Especially my friends in ministry that pastor in the suburbs. And, and people will say, what's going on with you? And, and I just start telling them stories because that's all I got. You know, what am I going to make stuff up? I'm just telling them stories about what God's doing. And they're like, oh, whoa, you were sitting on the corner talking to somebody and praying with somebody who was high and the paramedics came and went, wow, I don't know how you do it. And I'm like, I don't know how you do that. I don't want none of that right there. I will gladly sit on the corner with somebody who's stoned and be Jesus to them. I love it. That's my, I love it. And here's what I saw. Here's what I saw. Because people will say, you know, you're working with, with addicts and inmates and convicts and alcoholics. And, you know, here's the thing, though. Those are the folks that the miracles come through. Those are the folks that the miracles come through. Because I'm going to tell you right now, and if you've ever found yourself in that situation, if you've ever found yourself addicted, you know that you get overlooked all the time. If you're homeless, you know that people work hard not to even give you eye contact. They will see you panhandling and they will look the other way to make sure that they don't feel accountable or guilty for not giving you anything. Can I tell you something? Who gave the bread and the fish? It was a little boy, right? How do you know it was a little boy? I looked in Matthew's gospel and he doesn't tell us this was a little boy. I looked in Mark's gospel and Mark doesn't tell us it was a little boy. I looked in Luke's gospel, tells the same story. It doesn't tell us it was a little boy. When we get to the gospel of John, we find just a little side note that says it was a little boy. But what we do find in Matthew chapter 14, verse 21, is it says about 5,000 men were fed that day. Listen to this boast. About 5,000 men were fed that day. They got big appetites, and they're the ones that count in society. And the women and the children, they don't even count. We're not, literally, we're not counting them. And as a cultural construct of the day, Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't even mention the little boy. It's only the disciple that Jesus loved, the disciple 
that, that Jesus turned his affection to and said, John, you, you matter to me. I know you've been overlooked by lots of people. I know you've been overlooked by other teachers and rabbis, but I see you. And so John sees the little boy and he recognizes that the miracle came through the one who wasn't counted. I love that story. And God made that pop off the pages to me when we were on vacation and I've never seen it before. It was just like, God, how did I miss this? But that's why we do what we do at Hope City. That's why we're called Hope City. Because other people have been overlooking and not counting so many that stand in the shadows of this building. But we will be the ones that are counting the ones who don't count. We'll be the ones using what they bring. We'll be the ones that say, yeah, we'll take what you've got. Yeah, you bring what you have to the table. Not only can we serve you, we can use you. God can work through you. You have a purpose. You have a plan. God has an assignment for you. He knit you together in your mother's womb, and today's your day. You're sitting in a room with people that others had given up on and nobody was counting. Can I tell you something? They are some of my favorite people to hang out with. They are walking, talking, living, breathing miracles. And when I watch them get involved and serve and love, man, are you, guys, this is what God does. He's a miracle-working God. Man, I could go on and on and on and on and on, but I won't. Jesus gave you a day off because he loves you. John 10.10 10 tells us that, right? The thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. But I came. I came so that you could have life and have it abundantly. Would you stand with me? I want to pray over you. Dear God, everything that you tell us in this book is fire. Everything that you wrote down for us to read was to allow us to know you, to see you, to allow your plan to be revealed to us and in us. God, you set things in place so that we could live life to the fullest. Lord, you didn't come to make bad people good people. You came to make dead people alive people. You came to resurrect us. You came to set us on your path, Lord. Resurrection doesn't come right before we hit heaven. Resurrection came when we crossed the line of faith and said, yes, today I've chosen. I'm going to serve Jesus. I'm going to follow him. And you took me from who I used to be. And you resurrected me into who you've called me to be. And you set me in place. And you've given me authority. You've seated me in heavenly places with the King of kings and Lord of lords. And God, I am thankful because I'm the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. I'm the one that you loved and you died for. And so, God, we lean into that today. We say thank you for the miracles, signs, and wonders. And we ask, Lord, that you would move in us this week. Move in us this week. Help us to take our rest seriously. Help us to give ourselves to you completely. And God, I pray that you would do more in that 24-hour period than you do all week long in us to remind us of who you are and whose we are. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everybody said, amen. God bless you guys.